And it is so rare, in fact, that most geologists believe that the largest concentration of box workers found in this particular cave, they estimate that 95% of the world's known box workers found in every cave. Now, there is some box work in some of the other Black Hills caves. The Jewel Cave has some near the town of Custer, some of the other privately known caves in the region. But we have the most. And then the next closest place to find box work, you have to travel over to the Czech Republic in Europe. So what you guys are going to see today, um, not very many people do see. Any when they come on tour. So we're going to take a look at that. The other cool thing about Wing Cave is that we haven't found the end of this cave yet. We're still actively searching and exploring and finding more and more cave passages. Now, this young lady here, she said that uh, she had been in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. And Mammoth Cave holds the distinction of being the longest cave system in the world. They have over 300 miles of passageways that have been mapped and surveyed at Mammoth Cave, located in Kentucky. The second longest cave in the United States is found here in the Black Hills, and that is Jewel Cave, which is located near Custer. They have currently 127 miles of cave passage, but they haven't found the end of their cave either. And when Cave, we rank number four in the U.S. in terms of length. The fourth longest cave in the U.S. is a cave down in New Mexico. I can't even begin to pronounce it. Lecha, Lechila, or something like that. They're number four in cave length, excuse me, in cave length in the U.S. Um, in terms of the world scope, Wing Cave is the sixth longest cave in the world. Currently, we are at 104 miles of cave passageways that have been mapped and surveyed, and we're still finding more and more of these passages. Now, to give you an idea about how much uh, cave that we find every year, um, we reached our 100-mile mark last October. And from October until August, we found another four miles of Cape Passage. All right? So our exploration is ongoing. We keep doing it um, every so many months. You know, we get people going, poke around in there, find more Cape. All right? Now we're going to be seeing a very, very small portion of Wing Cape. We're only going to see about a half mile out of that 104 miles of passageways that's down there. And when I say we have 104 miles of passages, that's kind of confusing for most people because that 104 miles is not stretched out over 104 miles of surface area. Instead, it is packed and compressed into about one square mile of surface area. So in other words, all of the cave is located directly underneath the parking lot, the visitor center, kind of back out onto the hill um, behind us over there and underneath where we're standing right now. A good way to visualize the passageways in Wing Cave is to think of a common household sponge. Okay? You've got a cleaning sponge. You kids know about SpongeBob SquarePants, right? Okay. You know, SpongeBob has all those holes in it. All right. Well, the passageways in Wing Cave are laid out like the holes in a sponge arm. Okay? They interconnect all over the place, vertically, horizontally, diagonally, all throughout the bed of limestone rock that the cave is formed. It's what geologists call a maze cave system. So when you look at this map, it just looks like a bunch of squiggles, but really this map just identifies all of the different passages. Now you notice there's three different colors on the map, and that represents the three different levels or layers of the cave itself. The deepest portions of Wind Cave are identified by the dark brown areas that you see on the map, and the middle section or middle zone of the cave is identified by the cream or beige colors. And then the gray chambers and rooms that you see on here represent the rooms that are closest to the surface, to the top. All right. Today on our trip, we're going to spend most of our time in the middle section and the upper section of Wind Cave. Now, we're not going to go down to the deepest portions of the cave. If you look here on the map, everybody see this blue? Okay. What the blue is, those are underground lakes that are underneath the ground. This is the natural water table. And it's currently located, the water table is about 500 feet below the surface. Now, a water table, for those of you who've never heard that term, if you were to drill or build a house here in this region and you needed to drill a well, you'd have to drill down 500 feet to hit water. Okay, that's what the water table is. Um, but this water table, these are large underground lakes. They're about the size of a football field that's underneath the ground. So they're quite large, all right? Um, and this is the deepest portion of the cave, 500 feet below the surface. Today, we're going to be going down about 379 feet okay, at our deepest portion. Any questions for Mark? It's only about the size of my hat where okay, it's a really tiny little hole. And the story goes that the cowboy, he kind of leaned over, his name was Tom Bingham. He leaned over and as he looked into the hole, the winds were blowing so strong out of it, it actually blew his cowboy hat off of his head. A couple days later, he thought he'd brag about this hole in the ground he found, brought some friends back, but instead of the winds blowing out of the hole, the winds were actually sucking into the cave. And this is a, a natural phenomenon that happens at the natural entrance. We're not going to see the natural opening on this tour, but after
tour, you're welcome to come back and go see the original opening that was discovered in 1881. Now, what causes the winds is due to a change in the barometric pressure outside of the cave. Um, the cave actually is a, a wonderful barometer. It tells us when we're going to have a thunderstorm and, and all kinds of stuff, much better than the guys in Rapid City do. <laughs> okay. But what happens is um, when, the, when the air pressure changes outside of the cave, the cave tries to compensate and equalize the two air pressure systems inside and outside. So if you have a low air pressure system moving into the region, the winds will blow out of the cave. And when you have a high air pressure system coming in, the winds will suck into the cave. We call this cave breathing. It's just a natural exchange of the oxygen and, and airflow patterns. Sometimes you won't feel any winds blowing at all, and that just means the air pressure inside and outside are equal. So, and earlier today, it was it was blowing out. So that means we might have an evening afternoon thunderstorm. Okay. Questions? All right, well, let's head on in. I'll collect your tickets as we go into the cave. Um, I can only take 10 of you at a time. <laughs> also a special place because it's a sacred place to a certain group of people, and that is the Lakota, who are the Native Americans that lived in this area. The Lakota actually believe that the great buffalo spirit, Wankantanka, lives and dwells within the depths of Wind Cave. And it is from this cave that Wankantanka places the sacred bison out onto the plains of the prairies for their sustenance and their survival. And so, in a way, Wind Cave, you can think of it maybe as the home of the gods, in a way. Um, and so we ask that you respect the cave as the sacred place for them, um, as well as um, respect the cave for its unusual cave formation. So as you go along, please uh, refrain from touching the rocks and the formations, and hold on to the cold, clammy handrails, because that gives you a good idea about what the cave walls feel like. Okay? <laughs>
And this limestone um, has, you know, fossil seashells and various things like that in it. However, limestone is a soft rock in terms of softness and hardness of rocks. And it erodes or washes away very easily when it comes in contact with water. But it's just, just not ordinary water. It's a special kind of water called carbonic acid. Now, what happened, and some of you may be able to see me, and some of you may not, but I'll try to kind of put my hands. Basically, my hands represent the bed or the layer of limestone rock that covered this portion of South Dakota. When the Black Hills Mountains were being formed, the land pushed upward. And as it did so, limestone doesn't bend very well. But it pushed it upward enough to where eventually the limestone cracked and broke. And as it cracked, it made large cracks and fissures, which eventually became the cave passageways that you're standing in. But it also made millions and millions of tiny <coughs> hairline cracks and fissures deep within the limestone rock itself. Now, what happened is, when it rained on the surface, rainwater would seep down through the dirt and in the soil, and it would pick up a mineral in that soil called carbon. When water and carbon mix together, it forms a very weak acidic solution called carbonic acid. We drink carbonic acid all the time in the form of soda pop. Okay, so that tells you how weak of an acid it is. It causes the fizzle in soda pop. But this acid groundwater as it seeps down through those little hairline cracks and fissures in the limestone, what will happen when that acid touches the limestone, a chemical reaction occurs. And it begins to fizz, and it begins to bubble, and it begins to eat away the limestone rock. Now as it does this, it washes out a crystal or a mineral that makes up limestone. And this mineral is called calcite. The calcite is dissolved in this little water droplet. And as the water continues to seep deeper and deeper into the cave, following along those hairline cracks and fissures, after a while, it begins to fill back up those cracks with the calcite crystal. So what you have is a bunch of cracks in the limestone that begins to be filled up with the calcite crystal. Okay? Is everybody with me on that? 